All right, back to London now. Here is UK President, Prime Minister, rather, Boris Johnson. Let's listen. The United Nations voted to condemn Putin's war. And 39 countries, including the UK, Canada and the Netherlands, uh, voted uh, to refer Putin's actions to the International Criminal Court. This is the largest such action the court has ever seen and will allow the chief prosecutor to, op to open an investigation to ensure Putin cannot commit these crimes with impunity. As Ukrainians resist Russia's onslaught with courage and tenacity, the international community must aid their struggle in every way that we can. We will only succeed if the whole international community moves together with the same spirit of unity that we've seen in recent days. Justin and Mark and I have been discussing that today. And later this afternoon, I'm going to be speaking to the leaders of the United States, France and Germany uh, further to coordinate our actions. Uh, to aid these efforts, today the UK is joining our Dutch and Canadian friends to mobilize more practical and sustained support for Ukraine. Our new international Ukraine support group will coordinate the efforts of the international community to provide long-term and unwavering assistance now and in the future. And we will be encouraging more countries to join us. This is the moment for Ukraine's friends to create a coalition of humanitarian, economic and defensive military support to ensure that Putin fails. And that's why today I'm announcing a further £175 million of UK aid for Ukraine, $100 million of which will be provided directly to the Ukrainian government. This brings the total UK support announced during this crisis to around £400 million. After 12 days, it's already clear that Putin has made a miscalculation. He has underestimated the Ukrainians, their heroic resistance. He's underestimated their leader. And he has underestimated the unity of the West. And we will continue as colleagues to do everything we can to strengthen that unity in the days ahead to ensure that Putin fails in this catastrophic invasion of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister Johnson, for hosting. It's great to be joined here by uh, Prime Minister Rutte as well. It's been a very productive first day of my trip to Europe. We've been focused on solidarity with partners and allies. We're focused on stronger economic ties, jobs, growth, and, the middle cl and support for the mid middle class. <clears throat> but also, obviously, for standing up for democracy against authoritarianism and standing with Ukraine every step of the way. This morning, I was able to have an audience with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II at Windsor Castle. Uh, we congr congratulated her, obviously, on the Platinum Jubilee uh, and uh, was able to talk a little bit about the situations we're facing and uh, draw on her uh, long experience uh, for having seen much over these past, uh, past decades. Um, when I met earlier with Boris, we discussed stronger security ties, continuing to defend our shared values, uh, continuing our work together on advancing free trade and creating more middle class jobs, uh, and also on climate action, where we need to build a sustainable, secure future. I also had a bilateral meeting with Mark Rutte, where we talked about the enhanced importance of NATO, uh, continuing to work together to fight disinformation and protecting freedom of the press, and continuing to work uh, strongly with our friends in the European Union. But of course, throughout, uh, the focus is on the people of Ukraine and our solidarity with Ukraine, our pushing back against uh, the illegal uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, and uh, standing up for democracies around the world. Le Premier ministre Johnson, le Premier ministre Rutte et moi avons parlé de notre réponse commune face à la Russie. On se mobilise pour répondre à la Russia, crise. We mobilize to meet the humanitarian crisis. We insist for Russia to implement a ceasefire to protect the civil population. And obviously we insist for Russia to end the invasion and leave Ukraine. Working together to mobilize the global community to step up to support Ukraine and we'll continue to defend democracy and the values that underpin it and continue to make sure 
that Putin is held accountable. Today, Canada is announcing new sanctions on 10 individuals complicit in this unjustified invasion. This includes former and current senior government officials, oligarchs, and supporters of Russian leadership. The names of these individuals come from a list compiled by jailed opposition leader Alexei Navalny. These sanctions put increased pressure on Russia's leadership, including on Putin's inner circle. This is, of course, in addition to all the other sanctions we've announced, including our recent announcement on imposing massive tariffs on Russian and Belarusian imports. The work we're doing together is punishing Putin and his enablers where it hurts most, in particular by crippling their financial systems and sanctioning their central bank. So far, in aid for Ukraine, Canada has sent about a billion dollars worth of financial assistance and humanitarian aid, uh, but we have more to do. Demain, je serai en Lettonie pour rencontrer... Tomorrow, I will be in Lettonie to meet the Secretary General of NATO. We are here today as close uh, transatlantic NATO allies. Um, throughout history, our countries have always been closely linked. And in times of crisis, in times of war, we stand shoulder to shoulder. And so today, as war and violence once again cast a dark shadow over Europe, we are working together for peace and security on the European continent. And I'd like to thank Prime Minister Johnson, Borth, I thank you so much for bringing us together uh, today uh, at this timely moment. Because it has been another weekend of horrific violence in Ukraine. We knew it already, but in recent days it has been confirmed that Putin remains unmoved. We are dealing with an aggressor who keeps crossing new boundaries. Civilians and civilian targets, and even a nuclear power plant, have been attacked recently. And we know now that Putin has used cluster bombs. We can only guess what he plans to do next. But one thing is certain, Russia's aggression must stop. And in our meeting this morning, we again stressed the importance of unity. To all Ukrainians, we say this, your courage, and your resistance, exemplified by President Volodymyr Zelensky, deserves our utmost respect. Your resolve is our resolve. We will continue to stand by you. In the past few days, aid and military supplies have been sent to Ukraine from the Netherlands, as well as the UK and Canada. And we will continue to do everything we can to help uh, Canada. The Netherlands is prepared to consider, and we are all prepared to consider, all possible sanctions that can help put pressure on Russia. And obviously there is a lot of debate going on about uh, energy sanctions. And here we, mo we should not make a mistake. We have to ensure that they don't generate unmanageable risks to energy supplies in Euro European countries and beyond, including Ukraine as has also been stated today by German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, and I think rightly so. So that means that we still need European companies to continue their work towards Russia. Uh, and that is uh, important. And of course, what we need to do over time is to make sure that we reduce dramatically our energy dependency on Russia. That's clear. Finally, I am pleased that there is a broad international agreement on the fact that possible war crimes must be investigated. We must document everything that points towards human rights violations now, so that when the time comes, we can prosecute and try those responsible. Peace and justice must win out over violence and injustice. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you, Justin. Let's go now to the media. Gary Gibbon, Channel 4. <clears throat> Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, could you elaborate all perhaps a bit more about the energy discussions and where, there's a, where they're going? Uh, the US Secretary of State said there are active discussions for an oil ban from Europe. It sounds as though you don't feel that's the case, uh, Prime Minister. And, and you, Prime Minister, uh, uh, your views are characterised in the newspapers this morning as saying the West should have a climate change pass. Should we bust through the caps for a while? in order to insulate Europe from Russia, whether it's going to turn supplies off or we're going to 
uh, walk away from them in Europe. And one quick one, if I may, to you specifically, Prime Minister, on refugees. Um, whether the numbers are still 50 that have come to this country or have gone up a little, uh, it seems like they've only gone up a little. Isn't that embarrassing? Thanks. Well, let me, let me just, uh, uh, before I bring in colleagues on the, uh, on the hydrocarbons uh, issue, uh, I think there are, there are different dependencies in, in different countries, and we have to, uh, we have to be mindful of, of that. And uh, you can't simply close down uh, use of, uh, of oil and gas uh, overnight, uh, even from, from Russia. That's, that's, that's obviously not something that uh, every country around the world can, can do. Uh, we can go fast in the in the UK. Other countries can go fast, but uh, there, are, there are there are different dependencies. What we need to do is to make sure that we're all moving in the same direction and we all share the same assumptions, and that we accelerate uh, that move. And I think that is what uh, you, you're going to see, and you've you've heard that from uh, from leaders around the world. And actually, I see no inconsistency, by the way, uh, in moving away uh, from dependency on uh, on Russian hydrocarbons to moving away from dependency on, on hydrocarbons all, altogether. And, uh, you know, you can see how uh, it, this will encourage the world uh, to go, Gary, for, uh, for, for green solutions wherever possible. But clearly, there is going to be a transitional period. We're going to have to look for supply. We're going to have to look for substitute uh, supplies uh, from elsewhere. And we're going to have to do it uh, together across the, uh, the entire coalition of countries uh, that is now uh, condemning uh, Putin's actions. And on your, on your, um, your point about um, uh, the, the UK's uh, reception of, uh, of, of refugees, we are absolutely determined to uh, be as generous as we possibly can. And uh, as I speak to you all, we're, we're processing thousands, clearly, uh, of applications. Clearly, as the, as the situation has, has got worse, uh, we are going to have to make sure that we, we do even more. And the routes that we have that already, the family reunion route offers the prospect of hundreds of thousands uh, coming here. Uh, the, the humanitarian sponsorship route is, is also uncapped. And uh, we're putting people out into, uh, into all the surrounding countries, into, into Poland, into uh, Bulgaria, Romania, as well as into, uh, into Calais, to France, uh, to make sure that we receive people and we help, we help people to, to come. Don't forget, the UK, uh, since 2015, uh, has been the most generous, and with you know, great respect to, to Mark and all, all, all other European colleagues, we've been the most, most generous of, uh, of all European countries in settling uh, vulnerable people. Uh, we took a large number of, of Afghan refugees, as you remember, under op uh, pitting, and uh, we will, uh, and, uh, and uh, 104,000 uh, Hong Kong Chinese have, have, have applied under asking. We will be very, very generous, as the people of this country uh, would expect and would want. Uh, to people fleeing the war in in Ukraine, and I know that's going to be the instinct of the, of the British people. But uh, colleagues, on the on the on the yeah. uh, hydrocarbons, well, the, the the painful reality is that we are still very much dependent on Russian gas and Russian oil, and if we now would force European companies uh, to quit doing business with Russia, that would have um, enormous ramifications uh, around Europe including Ukraine, but also around the world. So we have to dramatically reduce our dependency on gas and oil from Russia. That will take time. Uh, a statement earlier today by Olaf Scholz, uh, the Chancellor of Germany, I think, was in the same uh, direction. Uh, so the painful reality is there. Uh, and that means that uh, we have to be very clear and make no mistakes here. This is a step-by-step -step, uh, approach. Uh, and that means that we have to make sure that the energy supplies in this part of the world again, including Ukraine, but also in the rest of the world, are not hindered. And that will take time. I think what is clear is that uh, many countries have realized that continued reliance on uh, Russia's oil and gas is a problem for the future. What we're seeing with uh, the solidarity and the unity, uh, not just of uh, countries and democracies across Europe and, and North America, but indeed countries around the world uh, looking at uh, trying to secure more uh, reliable sources of energy, particularly green sources. What we're seeing is a shift in Europe and elsewhere to understand that Russia is no longer a reliable partner. What Vladimir Putin has broken here is a trust 
where I've heard a number of Europeans reflect on it's too bad that we are so dependent on Russian oil, but we're not going to make that mistake again, and they are moving away from it. Canada uh, imports negligible amounts of uh, Russian petrochemicals and oil. Uh, we've banned that, uh, but we are, of course, self-sustainable in terms of uh, uh, oil uh, and energy, but uh, we will be there to support as the world moves beyond Russian oil and, indeed, beyond fossil fuels to have more renewables in our mix. Thanks very much, Gary. Uh, Raymond Fillion of, of TVA. <coughs> Last days, many countries have announced some significant increase of their military budgets. Germany has gone from 1.4% to the Canadian level of 2%. What will Canada do? As you know, uh, many years ago, we put forward a plan to increase our military investments by about 70 percent in Canada, and we continue to follow that plan. But we are looking attentively at the needs and the reality of the situation. We have a budget coming. We are looking at the investments we need to make, but we recognize how important it is to ensure that our armed forces have the necessary tools to protect Canada and participate fully in NATO missions. We have always done so, but we're looking at that. A number of years ago, we put forward a uh, defence plan that included increasing our defence spending by 70 per cent. Uh, but we also recognize that uh, the context is changing rapidly around the world, and we need to make sure that the women and men who serve in the Canadian Armed Forces have all the equipment necessary to be able to stand strongly, as we always have as members of NATO, and we will uh, continue to look at what more we can do. Thanks very much, um, Justin. F uh, Fleur Lansbeck from NOS. Hello. Um, I have a question for Prime Minister Johnson. Uh, last week, there was a journalist in Poland that asked you, why do Ukrainians have to flee their homes? Why are their children taking the hit in this war while Putin's friends and his inner circle are still living in London's most beautiful houses and taking their children to private schools? I was just wondering, has anything changed since that question was asked? Uh, thank you very much, Fleur. Yes, it certainly has. And I think that you, if you look at... Uh, what we've done uh, just today uh, with the, the economic crime bill. We're taking, uh, we're taking steps uh, to ensure that we whip aside the veil of, of anonymity uh, that, that obscures the ownership of the, of the properties that, uh, that you describe, so you can no longer use a, a bogus company uh, to conceal your ownership of a, of a property. We're, we're, we are uh, making sure that we have new powers to... Uh, Distrain to take people's uh, to take people's assets, uh, and we think that that will have. Uh, we think that the whole package of measures that we're putting forward today uh, will uh, have raw assent uh, in just a, in just a few days' time. So uh, we're moving very very fast on that. But Fleur, I hope that uh, you know our viewers and, and all of you will recognise that that is in addition uh, to the huge work that the UK has done together uh, with uh, with Mark and, and with Justin on the big package of international sanctions. And um, if you look at what we did on, uh, together on, on SWIFT, what we did on the, on the, uh, the Russian central bank, uh, it, uh, it's already had a, a profound effect. And uh, I think I'm right in saying that even today, the, the Russian stock market is, is not opening. And uh, you know, it's not a testimonial I necessarily seek, uh, but I, you know, I observe that the, uh, the Russian foreign ministry uh, said that the UK had not been entirely uh, helpful uh, in, this, uh, in this regard uh, towards uh, their own uh, economic interests. And I'm sure you, you'll have seen uh, what she said. Uh, and we are going to continue uh, to work with uh, colleagues to ensure that uh, we, we tighten the, the vice uh, around President Putin's regime. Uh, look, what's happening now is that uh, he, he, the President of Russia is, is plainly doubling down. Uh, he's decided that uh, he's going to continue with uh, an all-out onslaught on uh, centres of habitation in a way that uh, we think is utterly repugnant. Uh, it's clear that we're going to have to do more. And uh, as, as friends and partners, that's what we're, that's what we're going to do. Uh, I don't think that question was for anybody else. Let's go to Jason Groves from the, the Daily Mail. 
Um, thank you. You've all had some success uh, with your sanctions. They're squeezing Russia, but they're also having an impact here. We've seen the gas price treble. We're seeing petrol prices heading towards £2 a litre. What do you say, Prime Minister, to people who desperately want to help but are worried about that? Can you give a commitment now that there is going to be more help on the way? Mr Trudeau, can I ask, is Canada ready to uh, increase its oil and gas output to help we, Mr Rutter and others uh, off that Russian gas? And also, you've seen the Queen today. How is she? We've not seen her for a while. Is she fighting fit? Jason, look, it's a really important question. I think everybody is going to be uh, thinking that you, you've everybody's seen what's happened to the price of oil. Uh, this 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 matters uh, deeply, which is why I think what Mark had to say uh, earlier on about the need to pr to proceed in uh, in steps is is correct, uh, and we must you know do everything we can to protect. Uh, consumers and the public. There are going to be impacts. Let's be in no doubt there are going to be impacts. Uh, but I think that uh, it's, the, it's the right thing to do. Uh, but we've got to, and it, it's the right thing, it, it's completely the right thing to do to, uh, to move away from uh, Russian hydrocarbons, from dependence on Russian hydrocarbons. But uh, we've got to do it step by step. So far, the success of, uh, of the West has been in the unity uh, that we've shown. I think we're all increasingly united in the view that we've got to move away now uh, from Russian hydrocarbons. We've got to do it together. We've got to make sure that we have substitute uh, and, su and substitute supply. And that's what we're, uh, we're working on as well. And is there going to be more help on the way? Uh, we will do everything that we can to ensure that we have uh, substitute and substitute supply. So uh, one of the things that we're looking at is the uh, possibility of the uh, of uh, using more of our own hydrocarbons, and you'll have heard already what uh, the business secretary has had to say about uh, about licences uh, for uh, for UK uh, uh, UK own domestic production. Uh, that doesn't mean that we are in any way abandoning our commitment to uh, reducing CO2. Uh, you can you can do that, but we've got to reflect the uh, the reality uh, that uh, there is a crunch on. At the moment, uh, we need to intensify our, our self-reliance uh, as a transition uh, with more hydrocarbons. But what we also need to do is go for more nuclear and, uh, and much more uh, use of renewable energy. And I'm going to be setting out a, an energy strategy, an energy supply strategy uh, for the country in the, in the days ahead uh, so that people have a sense of how we're going to uh, meet people's needs over the, 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 the short, medium and, and long term. Marieke, uh, sorry, sorry. Apologize. Justin, sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Um, what we learned over the past couple of years is that global challenges uh, have impacts domestically. Uh, COVID crisis was a perfect example of disrupted supply chains that uh, led to significant inflation challenges around the world. Uh, we made a promise to Canadians that we'd have people's backs, and that's exactly what we've been focused on. Uh, the challenge right now of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine is having ripple effects around the world, not just uh, in energy prices for Canadians and for people in Europe, but for people in the global south as well. Disruption of the UN food program, disruptions uh, that are happening that we are going to have to adjust to and we are going to have to make sure we are there for each other. Uh, and that is the focus that we have uh, as partners. But uh, it's why we've all been reaching out around the world to talk uh, with fellow leaders about the challenges they're facing, the challenges their people are facing. Because what we are learning about Russia's unreliability as a trading partner needs to be remembered. But we also have to work together to provide substitutes, to provide alternatives. And of course, we need uh, to move uh, forward to decarbonizing our economies, but we need to do that in a way that supports people through that process, and we're going to continue doing that. Uh, in regards to Her Majesty, I have, I have the particular privilege of having known Her Majesty uh, or for about 45 years now, uh, and I can tell you that in my conversation uh, with her this morning. She was as insightful and perspicacious as ever, uh, very interested in what's going on, asked me all sorts of questions about Canada, and we had a really useful, for me anyway, conversation about uh, global events, as we always do. Thanks very much, Justin. Okay. Uh, uh, Marika Walsh from the, uh, from the Globe and Mail. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, a few questions for all three of you. 
Uh, you're talking about this humanitarian coalition. What exactly is that? What good will it do for the people of Ukraine concretely? And regarding sanctions, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is announcing more today, but we haven't seen it actually change the behavior of Russia in Ukraine. So is enough being done on that? And Prime Minister Johnson, particularly for you, you spend more than the 2% target in NATO. Canada spends well less. Is that acceptable to you? Uh, so, uh, should you want to have a go at that first? No, I'll go, go, okay, go well, thank it, you, Marika. <laughs> uh, Marika, thank you very much. Look, uh, yes, it's true, we spend about 2.4% now. Um, uh, but uh, look, I, and I, um, I, I think that Canada is a fantastic ally, friend, and, and, and partner, and, and I'm not going to make <coughs> any, any comment on, uh, on, uh, on Canada's approach, except to say uh, this that I do think that the world is clearly changing. And I think that what we can't do uh, post uh, the invasion of Ukraine is assume that we can go back to a kind of status quo ante, a, a kind of new normalization in the way that we did after uh, the invasion of Crimea in 2014 or the, or the, 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 the seizure of Crimea and, 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 uh, uh, and, and the Donbass area. Uh, we, we've got to recognize that things have changed and that we need a new focus on our collective security. And I think that that, that, is, that is kind of uh, increasingly understood uh, by, by everybody. And uh, on, your, on your first point about what the, the humanitarian coalition, uh, look, I mean, the whole world is now coming together to try to help avert a, a total catastrophe in, uh, in, in Ukraine. It, it's already very, very grim uh, indeed. We're doing everything in our power uh, to prevent it from getting, uh, from getting worse. Um, and one of the most important things is to look after people fleeing uh, the war zone, and, and all of us in our in our different ways are, are doing a lot. As, and you'll have heard the uh, the sums that we've announced today to uh, to help the the immediate vicinity and and what we're doing to take people. But I know that both uh, the, the gentlemen on my uh, here who are here with me, uh, th their countries have a fantastic record uh, of humanitarian uh, help. Uh, well, on, uh, <clears throat> on defence spending, we decided early January when the new team, the new cabinet started to ramp up uh, defense spending uh, by billions of euros and that will bring us close to the uh, two percent uh, and probably we need to do more, uh, particularly given what has happened over the last two weeks. But the Netherlands will spend a lot of extra money on defense and I think rightly so. The Ukrainian coalition, I think it is crucial that this is not only NATO, uh, European Union working together, but that it is the whole world yeah. uh, coming together uh, to uh, defend uh, the basic values and the international uh, legal order as it has been established after the Second uh, World War, and uh, which is now being challenged um, by one country invading the second biggest European nation, being Ukraine, being invaded by the biggest European nation. So this is. This is a huge event uh, and this has huge uh, impact uh, on the whole world. And we have to bring together Africa, Latin America, Asia, uh, everyone who wants to be part of humanity, uh, to be part of such a humanitarian coalition. And yes, I agree with you, the, the sanctions so far have not had the desired effect. They have a huge effect on Russia, they are not against the Russians, uh, but against the Russian leadership, but of course it will have an effect uh, unavoidably and ultimately also on individual Russians that, that, that we cannot have, um, prevent. Uh, and I think in the longer term it will have a big impact uh, on Russia. It will also have an impact on how they will move forward. But you are absolutely right, at the moment, in the short term, uh, it has not led to the result that they stopped the invasion. That's true. But that's why we are resolved in being there for the long term. The courage of Ukrainians in standing up uh, to the Russian invaders has inspired and, and humbled us all. And we need to show ourselves as determined to push back against Putin, against the Kremlin, as hard as we can and as effectively as we can. And that's where, I mean, from the beginning, uh, Boris and I and a couple of others were pushing so hard on SWIFT, on uh, the central banks, on, on the Russian Central Bank, including going after their ability to draw on their reserves, something that even a week ago we didn't think uh, yeah. would be in the cards. And yet, uh, seeing just how strongly democracies around the world have stood and responded, I think is a surprise to Putin, perhaps a little bit of a surprise to all of us as well, that we actually can stand and push back really hard 
for the principles that drive us. And quite frankly, the unprecedented display of support of 141 countries at the United Nations supporting this resolution means that as we move forward, this is, of course, about Ukrainians and Ukraine. But it's also about more than that. It's about standing up for the rules-based order that has led to unprecedented peace and stability and growth around the world over the past many decades, and the pushback that one, like Russia, like Putin specifically, cannot overthrow those 75 plus years of peace and stability and still benefit from the economic largesse and growth that comes with that. And that firmness is not just Western democracies like us. That is uh, something that we've heard in our conversations, all three of us, with partners around the world who don't have the same kinds of ties to Ukraine, but are very, very concerned about the violation of the rule of law, the principle that suddenly might, might be right once again, the principle of territorial integrity, respect for sovereignty, the kind of neo-colonialism that Vladimir Putin is trying to impose upon Ukrainians. That's not going to fly. And the strength and the resolve of countries around the world to say, no, this is a moment to stand for democracy against disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, and to stay true to these values that have led to respect and prosperity around the world uh, that we continue to need to fight for, including in many different parts of the world, whether it's Afghanistan uh, or elsewhere as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, uh, Okay. Excuse me. Uh, we know that we've seen a demonstration, an extremely strong demonstration at the UN, 181 countries who rallied. Not all countries who have close ties with Ukraine, like Canada or other European countries. These are countries that have indicated that the respect of international rule of law and partnerships and the stability that we've built throughout the past decades is important. These are countries gathering, coming together for these values and principles that have led to prosperity. And Russia may not violate this peace and think to profit from this prosperity. It's an important moment for the world to show that we are there to stand up against the violation of fundamental principles. Last question is to Joost Dobber of Financial Dagblad. Thank you. Um, you have all stressed the importance of unity in the Western response to, to Russia. Um, but when it comes to energy sanctions, there seems to be uh, a big difference between your position and the position of the United States. Um, with um, Secretary of State Blinken coming out in favor of an oil ban, um, and also saying that there are um, advanced discussions with the Europeans about this. Um, was the American Secretary of State wrong to say that there are uh, advanced discussions? And um, Prime Minister Rutte, can you please also elaborate what the discussions uh, you are having in the European Union context are about this? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so let me just, just say quickly that, uh, no, I don't think t uh, Tony Blinken was wrong in the sense that uh, we're all together uh, now moving very, very fast and seeing that the, uh, something that perhaps uh, three or four weeks ago we would never have, cons have considered is, is now very much on the table. Uh, we have to consider how uh, we can all move away uh, as fast as possible uh, from dependence, reliance on Russian hydrocarbons, uh, Russian oil and gas. And everybody's doing that. Everybody's uh, on the same journey. Uh, some countries will find it uh, faster and easier than others. That's all. But we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to do it together because uh, and we're going to work together on making sure that we all have uh, the substitutes and the supplies that, that we uh, that we need. I agree. And if um, so in, in that sense, it is a um, 
uh, a step-by-step -step, uh, process. And we have to make sure that we deleverage our dependency uh, on Russian gas and Russian oil, uh, whilst acknowledging at the moment that that dependency is to a certain extent uh, still there. And uh, if we would force companies uh, to quit doing business with uh, Russia uh, in that realm, uh, that would have enormous consequences, because it would basically uh, undermine supply chains the world over, particularly in Europe. Uh, it would also uh, have an impact on Ukraine itself. Uh, and therefore, uh, my plea is uh, to do this diligently, uh, and not overnight, uh, and making sure that we speed up uh, the programs in all our countries to uh, decarbonize, uh, to green our economies. It makes it the more important uh, to do that. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues, uh, very much indeed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.